Hi everyone, Terry Walbrock here with a quick update on the upcoming courses that I'm releasing. A one day trauma warrior, a 10 day be your own hero, and a 30 day surviving to thriving. Um, and I sent they, them out to beta testers and the response has been absolutely incredible. I'm so excited. I just do a happy dance in my chair. <laughs> so I need to add a few little adjustment changes and it was more just adding some, some paragraphs for further clarification on trauma. Uh, but the overall response was incredibly positive. So really, really, really excited to get it out there into the universe and into your hands. So. All right, now for the show. Welcome everybody to the Healing Place podcast. I am your host, Terry Walbrock, and I am just super thrilled to have with me today, Dr. Bree Gentili. And she is here to talk about a subject that we have not yet touched upon. So I'm going to turn it over to her and let her tell her story of how she's transitioned into this work. So welcome, Dr. Bree. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. I'm very excited to be on this podcast and I'll just delve right into it. You know, I'm, I'm trained psychologist, um, turned re user research, and I started out as a psycho oncologist actually. Um, I was working with cancer patients and their families, and we would have a lot of conversations about a lot of different topics. And there was one thing that was coming up frequently, which was this fear for the patients and honestly the caregivers as well that. If they ask for a second opinion or if they wanted to get a new doctor or they were switching locations, for example, that they wouldn't get good care. And I was fascinated by this and I started to think about, hmm, I wonder if there's an app that they could do something differently um, and there'd be a better way for them to, quote unquote, break up with their doctors. So I just started thinking about it in my head. Nothing really came from it. Um, I ended up leaving the therapy world to start a company um, training chatbots, which was really interesting. It was the first time I had worked with chatbots. Um, and these chatbots were actually delivering evidence-based mental health. So I was asked originally to just do one module or one conversation um, about loneliness. And then I was asked to do another one for newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. And that got me thinking again about the app. And I started to put some things on paper and napkins and sketching things out. And I thought, hmm, maybe I could really do something with all of this, you know, knowledge of, of, of oncology and love for technology. And let's just see where it goes. Well, nothing came out of that again. So the universe kept bringing it back to me and I never quite entered into that creative contract. Um, so I decided to stick with the chatbots and then I started to get really interested in those conversations that people were having. And I was fascinated by the fact that people would just go on and on and on knowing that it was a chatbot, knowing that the responses that were coming from them were just going to be generated basically um, from things that we thought they were saying to us, right? And so it was it was a conversation, but really not a conversation at all. And they knew that up front and would oftentimes be reminded when they would say something and the chatbot wouldn't quite get it right. And so they would just continue. And I was just fascinated by that. And I started to think about them from a different perspective. And I started to think about them as users of a specific service rather than a product, which the service was of course therapy. Well, that got me thinking maybe I should go into user research. So I followed, you know, the track of the, the sniff and went for it and, and went, ended up at Google. Uh, and I was a user hard, I was user researcher for their hardware team. And I lasted there about 30 days and it was awful. I didn't like it. Um, it's a wonderful company, don't get me wrong. But I knew I was changing zero lives by doing benchmarking on keyboards and trying to figure out which mouse was quieter than the other mouse and whatnot. And so I left for nonprofit world, which everybody's reaction was as though I had broke up with the, the quarterback of the team. Um, <laughs> how did you leave a company like Google? Um, but it fit. It fit really well. So I ended up leaving for a nonprofit called the Center for Youth Wellness, 
which is located in San Francisco and more specifically in a district called Bayview, which is considered in, you know, around these areas, the last black neighborhood in San Francisco. So the nonprofit focuses on families going through adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and toxic stress. And I realized firsthand that there were a lot of barriers for families and communities with trauma accessing products and services. So of course there were the social determinants of health like transportation and lack of time. But what was really interesting was that there was also a lack of an acute awareness in messaging and marketing. And the fact that these families who are either, who have been through or are still going through um, experiencing trauma, they're not seeing themselves in this messaging of this smiling doctor on a brochure. And they're not being helped by blogs about how important it is to take care of your child and how, you know, if they don't get their crap together, their child is doomed. And a lot of the resources that were out there were great resources, but I noticed that they were for families who were, you know, had high resources available to them, who, um, you know, weren't living out of their car or who were two families and not single parent homes. So they still were not catching the vast majority of people and families who are experiencing trauma. So I started to think about what is it that we can do? How are, how are we able to do things differently and word things differently and use different colors and use different pictures in order to make them feel seen, heard, and acknowledged in their messaging? So it started out by just doing little content edits, right? Like making sure that we weren't shaming parents and, and making sure that we weren't, uh, you know, creating some sort of barrier or not acknowledging the barrier of their skin color that was saying, you know, I don't even want to seek professional help because I'm already being labeled just by being born the race that I was born. So it started really small. And then I had a lived experience that brought kind of all of this together, which was I lost my grandfather, who was a father figure to me all of my childhood and adult life. Um, I lost him in November of 2020 to COVID. And I found myself extremely isolated from all news because I wanted to stay in touch with news and things that were going on, but I couldn't see the word COVID-19. I couldn't see it. I was just so tired of it. I was angry and I had all of the all of the grief emotions that go along with it. And I started to think to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if every time I opened my news app, there is a way to filter what brought me joy or what I wanted to avoid that particular use. Not something I had to go into the back end of my settings and decide what I was interested in because I was still interested in, in health, for example. I just didn't want to read anything about COVID. And so I started to think back to my my cancer app idea I started to think about the work that I was doing and then started to think about my lived experience even more and it really got me thinking hmm if you search for something and you get a thousand things related to that for months on end that's going to perpetuate your trauma right so for example someone who was fired wrongfully fired and they search wrongful wrongful fire or employee rights something along those lines. They will continue to get things about um, wronged employees or employee rights or your you know, bad employers, and it can potentially re-traumatize them when the information that they were once searching for has already been found. But they can't get out of that, that, that drip, so to speak. They can't get out of that. So I started looking at other people who were doing this work um, you know, trauma-informed design, restorative design, inclusive design. I started following their work, and then I realized this is something really new. There's not a lot of people doing this. There's people maybe having conversations, but largely behind closed doors, and there's not a lot of people that are actually doing this. So that's when I decided uh, I was going to take all of my knowledge, all of the failed ideas that I never um, entered into a creative contract with, and I was going to create my own lab, my own design lab. So I created Dr. G's lab um, with the hopes of helping product and service designers become more restorative in their design practice. 
And all the while, I'm able to continue working at Center for Youth Wellness as um, uh, the director of product design and still continuing to help Bayview and other families nationwide see themselves more in these products and services. Wow. And there was so much there. I just, I, my mind is reeling with a million questions and, and statements to back up what you're saying. We talk about ACEs so often on this show. Um, I have a high ACE score myself. And uh, so the fact that you're doing such trauma-informed work, I mean, really looking at this through a trauma-informed lens is just so beautiful because really that's the way we're going to make a difference in the lives of so many people who have experienced trauma and or are still experiencing trauma. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you bring up a really good point that we're all talking about ACEs. You know, it's it's on the, it's on a lot of people's minds now, especially. And I think that's what really got me thinking about trauma-informed design was that I just knew a little bit too much. <laughs> I right. knew a little bit too much about it. And it wasn't a place that I could just stop and not do anything about it. So I love the fact that people are talking about it more and that that does make me feel a, a real big sense of relief that we're that we're having conversations about aces. Yes, for sure. Well, and I love it I I love it because I say it all the time myself that the universe just just does just keep coming around. I call them angel whispers myself, but something's happening on the shoulder saying, you know, keep redirecting, redirecting back to that path that really our soul work and what we you know, the direction we need to be going. So, I love it that you kept you keep following yours and making it happen. Um, so one of one of the next questions that I have for you then is, for your target audience, is it only people with high ACE scores or really is it anyone? I mean, your grandfather's death, I mean, it certainly um, is an indication that you don't want those COVID-19 reminders constantly popping up. So really your audience seems broader. It is. It is broader. And I, and I think what you're touching on is really important. And it's really important to me, too, which is that ACEs are probably more, uh, what's the word? They're more prevalent than one would think. And toxic stress even is experienced by vast majority of people, whether or not we want to call it that or whether or not somebody else labels it. We are all experiencing this low level of toxic stress. And you're absolutely right. You don't have to have a, a high A score. I, I have a high A score as well. And it's still, when I think of other people who I've had these conversations with who, are, who, who have low A scores, they are still getting it. They still get it. And so it is a broader audience. It's really anybody who's fed up with a particular topic or anybody who wants more of a particular topic that brings them joy and delight. We should be able to have that, that option at our fingertips, not just in the beginning when we set up our profile, but at every use, every opportunity that we engage, we should have that option and that empowerment, that freedom to choose something that's healing. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love it. And how fascinating because today uh, with two days left in April, I put out a little a little post on on the Facebook page for for the show, and said, "Hey, we're we have two episodes that are neck and neck for the number one spot. I do a top ten after each month, so people can tune in to the you know top ten uh, episodes. And the top two episodes touch upon joy. And how fascinating! I I, I just think people are just they're they're just being drawn to whatever it is that that brings that tranquility and yeah joyousness to life to their lives yeah absolutely yeah beautiful all right so um one another question that I had, and you had sent me back responses, and I'm I'm just so excited. I want to I want to hit on all of them. I told you before we hit record, we <laughs> normally don't get to most of these, but but so many of your responses were just um, amazing, and I really I really want to touch upon all of this. Um, so myths and facts, are there any that you want to clarify for listeners? I think the biggest one is, is when it comes to not just ACEs, but just toxic stress in general, whether it was from early childhood or you're a parent now or a caregiver now, and you know that your child is going through toxic stress because your environment is not 
quote unquote ideal. I think the biggest thing that I want to just just hit home is that it's never too late. Early is better, but it's never too late to heal trauma and repair ruptures. And I think it goes across the you know across the spectrum. I said parents and caregivers, but it also goes for educators. It goes for the justice system. It goes for product and service designers. Anyone who's experienced trauma or supported someone through trauma, it's never too late. Amen. Yes. <laughs> I, I say it all the time. I think one of my favorite hashtags is hashtag never give up because um, I know for myself personally, I was in my 40s when I finally stumbled across, upon EMDR therapy and did it for four years and it, it was life altering uh, and, and shifted everything in my life. No more panic attacks after 25 years of panic attacks. So yeah, it, it, you're right. Wow. And what a beautiful message to give out, to get out there. But like you said, to, to those who are, who aren't relating to the message to who, who are struggling to even understand. I love one of the things that you had said uh, in your responses in that. Um, and then it just went out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, oh my gosh, I, I so forgot what I was just going to say. But it, there was something amazing that you had written about. Um, oh, oh, here it is. That if, if, if people aren't even, like they, they question, is it okay to take care of myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, before yeah. taking yeah. care of my children, like, like they, they're even questioning that self-care is okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think in different cultures, it's, it's more pervasive, right? And so there is absolutely a tap on the shoulder, or a judgment or a whisper, or even a Facebook post or an Instagram post where you're like, Ooh, I could have done more for my child today. And the answer is largely, yeah, that will be your story every day. There will always be something you could have done more. And the point is that you can always find places where you were lacking, but if you don't take time either at the beginning or the end or the middle, some point in your day where you can sit and say, this is what I need to do for myself. This is what I've done for everybody else. And right now, this is just a little time for me. There will always be a lack because you're giving from a place that feels like it's not enough and you're bound and determined to feel at the end of the day that you did something and it's Still wasn't enough. Whereas if you have those mindful moments and you have that time where you've taken care of yourself, you can honestly say, I did that for myself and I did all these other things for everybody else. Now that's a whole different perspective. Now you're doing a lot. <laughs> so I think that it's something that we need to continue to have a conversation with as a society um, and as a social society. I think they're kind of two different, two different things, but we are continuing to have a conversation about self-care, which is great, but our messaging in all of the things about how to be a good parent, when there's something about here's how you take care of your kid, add content about how to take care of yourself. And we are really mindful about doing that. We have a toolkit out, which I'm super proud of working on. But we put tips on what to do with your kids around, um, you know, nutrition, for example. And then we'll also add a tip for the parent of how to, to do something that's nutritiously valuable for yourself, whether it's uh, pre pre thinking or pre selecting a snack, right, or having cut up fruit for yourself so you when your prefrontal cortex is offline and stress is taken over you've got those berries right there for you because you did that for yourself um, so I'm really mindful of all of the work that I do especially around caretaking to make sure that I put language in there that's explicit for the caretaker as a as an explicit reminder that you have to take care of yourself in order to take care of others it's important it's vital absolutely yes so now is your app uh, in a developmental stage? Is it, is it, um, are you have sponsors for it? Where, where is it in its stage of development? So it is still on a napkin, believe it or not. <laughs> it's still on I love a napkin it. <laughs> <laughs> because I know, um, you know, 
entering into a creative contract, especially when it's something that's trauma informed, it's almost as if you're entering into a therapeutic relationship with a client and any therapist who's, who's listening to this can relate. Um, it takes quite a bit of bandwidth, not just time, but emotional bandwidth in order to make a service helpful and healing. And so as I'm, as I'm having all of these, you know, uh, speeches and, you know, kind of nagging about being mindful when you're developing apps, I'm having that conversation with myself as I'm thinking about how do I do this app, right? And, and how do I make it speak not only to the parents who have resources and who are really well off and have even a plethora of resources, but how do I get to the parents who are living out of their car? How do I, how can I do this so that it means something to the people who need it the most and also to the people who need it the most, but don't have all of the resources. So needless to say, it's, it's on a napkin, um, but it's ready to be lifted off. I, I, just, I just need to enter into that contract um, that allows me to have that space to really think about who this is for and why am I doing this? Yes. Yeah. And you'll find it again. You'll keep being steered to it. I just feel it. I know it. And I can't yes. wait to I can't yes. wait to see it the day it launches. You can send it to me, and then I'll put it out on all my stuff. So <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you talk about something, um, the support and resources that you have utilized uh, or recommend to to the audience, and um, what is that? Yes, I am a huge believer in the seven domains of wellness. Um, Center for Youth Wellness has taken these as concepts and just really believed in them, researched them, and has made them into, like I said, into toolkits and made them into things that we can actually use. So there's seven of them, and they're basically seven supports that buffer the effects of ACEs and toxic stress. Uh, so sleep, nutrition, supportive relationships, mental health, mindfulness, exercise, and my personal favorite, getting out in nature. I make a point actually to schedule them in my calendar as repeating events, and I actually put them on my work calendar as well so people can see and be reminded that we need to actually carve out time for these domains of wellness and not just call upon them when we're in times of need because it's like going to the gym and wanting to do a pull up and you just can't do it, right? You, it takes practice. You can't just go up there and do and do a pull up unless you've practiced it. So I think that again, with self care and, and these domains, you have to practice them and you have to make a point to put them to put them as a priority. Otherwise, they get lost. And then when you need them, they're not refined. They're not ready to be used. They're just concepts. And that overwhelms you all over again. And then you have the same shaming cycle of, gosh, if only I knew how to do this and this and this and this. Well, start now when you don't need them, refine them, make a point of practicing to use them when you don't particularly need them. And then when it comes time to actually need them, you got them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm doing a little happy dance here in my chair because I do all of those <laughs> and it did, it became a habitual pattern because I practice them. A lot of those fall into, in my eyes under mindfulness practices of just taking those moments, those little nature moments. This morning I said, uh, I live on an Island. And so I had worked till eight o'clock last night on the show, uh, last night's episode. And I, so when I woke up this morning, I said, Oh my gosh, it's, beautiful. The sun is shining. I'm going for a bike ride. And it's, you know, under the Spanish moss and through just the beautiful nature of this island. And man, I absorbed, I actually got teary eyed at one point because I was so grateful, just filled with so much gratitude uh, for the beauty of the nature that surrounded me. And it really does bring you to this place of peace and tranquility. But I wouldn't have been there 20 years ago. I, I wouldn't have been there. So I, I did have to learn to practice it. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And even you just sharing that story of the Spanish moss and the sun, I was able to lower my cortisol levels just by hearing it and just by hearing about nature. So I, I want to say that you don't have to go out in nature if it's not safe, right? Because it's not safe for everybody to go outside. But looking at pictures, hearing nature sounds, listening to nature stories, 
those do almost the exact same as it would be if you went out in that walk. So I just, I love, I love hearing the stories and I could honestly listen to, to people's nature <laughs> stories all day because it, it does, it brings a visualization that um, is the same. And my mind doesn't know the difference, whether I was experiencing it or not. My ears do and my eyes do, but my mind doesn't actually know the difference. And I think that that's a, an important point to bring up. So I, and I'm also so happy that you went on that bike, Greg. <laughs> yes. And I'm so happy that you clarified that because it's such a great point to make is that not everybody can step outside uh, and be in in nature in that moment um, for whatever reasons. So yes, thank you for that very much so. All right, so let's talk about, um, you talk about the seven domains of wellness, but in your personal life, um, it's had an impact on you as well, correct? Yes, deeply. So um, I use them to overcome not only the current toxic stress that I'm going through in my life, but also um, in my journey in sobriety. So I just celebrated three years of sobriety mm -hmm. this last April. Very excited and very proud. Um, but I still have those moments, right, where I, where I feel really stressed. Um, where I know I'm not making great decisions, whether it's with food or choosing to not get outside and exercise. And I still have those moments of where I just like wish I could just, just have a drink that will lower my cortisol levels right away. Um, and instead, I have a little pile of seven domains. I just wrote them out on a piece of paper and I cut them up and I just dig in and I pick one out. <laughs> and it's always a surprise, even though there's seven of them, I still am always surprised which one I pick. And I just go with that. I go with that right away, whether it's eating or supportive relationship or, or sleeping, whatever it might be, I take that. And I've chosen sleep a couple times. It might be in the middle of the day or like five o'clock when, you know, obviously I don't want to go to sleep. But what it makes me do is either write a poem about sleep because poetry has been very healing. So I might write a poem or I may go outside or I may look at people, um, you know, pictures of babies or puppies sleeping. And so it, it always just gives me a little bit of a creative outlook, just enough for me to get my mind off of the craving that I had. So yeah. it's, it's all, they've always worked. I'm never, I've never been uh, disappointed by picking a random domain of wellness out of my little hat. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. And I celebrate your sobriety. I, I again, I talk about about this on the show quite often, but my mom is 85 years old and celebrating. It'll be two years sober in July. And she had never wow. given up alcohol before. And so that whole never give up, it's never too late. Yep. She's, she's a poster child for it because um, I, I truly, I always believed, but there was that other part that didn't and didn't think she'd ever be able to do it. And she has, and I just, I'm so proud of her. I can't stand it. Oh, yeah. way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. So anything else that you wanted to touch upon that we haven't had a chance yet to discuss? No, I've loved this conversation. This has been wonderful. And it's been beautiful to get to know you a little more as well. Oh, you as well. And I'm just, again, I'm just so excited about, well, this concept uh, and you making it happen, because again, I truly believe it's, it's very needed, but that, that you can make it happen. Um, and yeah, I, I can't wait for it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, oh, how do people get in touch with you or, or connect with you? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn, um, Bree Gentile, B-R-E Gentile, G-E-N-T-I-L-E. -E. Um, you can also look up the lab, which is drgslab.com. So uh, I hope that everybody just takes a little peek around just to see what restorative design and trauma-informed design look like. And I, I hope to have more conversations much like this. Yes, absolutely. I recently joined a... Um... Uh, oh my gosh, I'm so a, a, an online community um, app called Podmatch and have yes. had some great um, guests come join me and we've connected through there. So, um, and it, they have a free 
service. So you can go create a guest account there at Podmatch and find all kinds of podcasts that like there's 10 keywords you can put in and you could just find a whole list of wonderful shows to join because I would love to see you get out there and yeah, put this message out there because it's just, again, such a great idea. So yeah. Thank you. And I actually joined with your referral link that you had. Oh, posted. awesome. So. Yay. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I hope you get lots of connections. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And remember, until next time, be gentle with yourself. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening today to the Healing Place podcast with your host and trauma warrior, Terry Welbrock. If you enjoyed this episode and want to learn more about Terry, her mission, and the Hope for Healing journey, visit Terry's website at www.terrywellbrock.com. Thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, and offering your reviews on our YouTube channel, audio outlets, and Facebook page. And as Terry reminds us, until next time, remember, be gentle with yourself.